Here we go. Thanks very much. So the way that this is going to proceed, I'm going to start out by asking one question, and then we'll open it up to questions in the room, uh, and then try, if necessary, to pass around the mic so that, you, so that your question can get heard, as that often is a problem. Uh, so I, I, I'll just put this question to you. So concern has recently been raised by a number of researchers and by patients uh, with whom those researchers work who engage our health systems and providers in them that the system and those who work in them often demonstrate behaviors that rather than reducing suffering, in fact increase it. This so-called structural violence, often associated with the sorts of biases that Dr. Monroe pointed out, may be due to accepted practice protocols or prior training, even policies existing in those systems that are insensitive to patients' experiences and preferences. This has often been raised by, and often true for, patients with chronic problems like chronic pain for whom practice patterns are highly variable and in which situation often there's not clear guidance from randomized controlled trials or controlled studies for what the optimal treatment ought to be. What is your own health system and that which you work in doing to help the, your providers recognize and overcome the structural violence that is present in your systems? Better yes, no question. <laughs> I'm going to uh, um, turf this to my leader, uh, Dr. Yeast. But I, I do just have to challenge you. I mean, that is the most loaded question. I, I, I don't need no mic. I, I'll tell you, I, I, I'm just appalled at the uh, way that question was crafted. Structural violence. I mean, I, I'm not going to be able to speak to that. And I, but, but that is such a loaded way to describe something that, that, you know, I'm just a little, uh, you know, put off by that. Shall I say a little a bit more? A more diplomatic colleague of mine, uh, Dr. <laughs> Yates, handle that. Uh, Let me, uh, before I, just to sort of give everybody a chance to um, respond, this term is not one that I invented, but actually is one which is described in the literature that's, um, that's looked at this. And it's talking really about policies and practices which are present in the system, which patients experience as um, not contributing to their positive experience. So that's, it's not We're going to reconvene. A context or a certain vulnerable population. Yes, or correct. A couple of things first. As a generalization, I mean, I, I just. Is uh, Stuart you know, Monroe here? One who's worked so hard to practice the most patient-centered sort of you know, you know, compassionate care that I could possibly do. And, and I have great limitations. I have patients who would give me very low CAF scores, I'm sure, but, but, you know, an institutional goal of committing violence to the values, preferences, beliefs of patients really runs antithetical to everything that I personally have experienced. Not that I've been in every single healthcare environment in the country by no means, but I, I just, I, I had to, you know, I, he's going to address it, but I thought we should soften <laughs> the uh, framing of it into a way that is a little bit less uh, punitive to those who, you know, even if we're not as good as we could be, it could get better, are striving to do the very best thing that we can for our patients. And so I, I don't know. Uh, I totally agree with what John said. Uh, I, 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 like John, I haven't been in every hospital in the country. I've been in a lot, though, and have worked in several health systems around the country other than here. I, I, think, um, I think there's a tremendous amount of uh, effort in, in almost all health systems that I'm familiar with, and certainly ours, to address issues of, uh, of, of disparity in care, uh, address issues in patients. Uh, control of pain and alleviation of pain, and uh, that's literally a daily uh, discussion, I think. Uh, uh, I would also say that I think nursing staffs, nurses in, in uh, our health system, and I'm sure in many of the others that you all are from, are keenly aware of these issues, and a physician who fails to address them, they're going to be immediately uh, 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 addressed by the nursing staff. I think that's a very important issue. Anybody else want to comment? Well, 
That was a good answer, John. <laughs> so quick answer is yes. <laughs> but uh, you know, I belong to a system of eight hospitals, uh, in, which is a part of a national group of 162 hospitals. So how do we become an integrated system addressing a specific issue here, which is pain management in a patient population with chronic pain? And though there are no great answers nationally, there are some pain guidelines, and I represent the IRB, so we have a local consortium of pain specialists. They got together about a year and a half ago and came up with a plan on, to bring all these folks together to decide what's the best pain management for different aspects of pain, neuropathic pain, you know, different musculoskeletal pain, et cetera. In my day job, I'm a, uh, an oncologist in practice. A big chunk of the practice is pain management. But I hand off these patients after they reach a certain threshold to get other people involved. I think the answer is probably not the most science when you look for evidence. Absence of proof is not proof of absence. Mm. The issue here is listening, which we heard over and over and over again today. A patient's pain is not just the physical pain. There's a lot going on behind the scene which causes the pain, and that has to be looked at. It could be their educational background, it could be their home, it could be their transportation, name it, there's multiple factors. It's not just the pain medicine. So as a consortium, we need to, meaning the group here, has to look at both the physical, mental, but also the environmental pain infliction. And ultimately, it's not the structural violence. We are clunky. I think one of our speakers mentioned earlier, the ugly underbelly of medicine. Well, it's ugly, all right. And you come into the system, it's pretty clunky, all right. It still works. We just need to smoothen it and make it less clunky. Could you repeat the question? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think almost everybody that goes into the healthcare field goes in for good, honorable reasons. And I think everyone that does also has ways to improve and limitations. Uh, our hospital does what I think every hospital does, I hope, is to, which wasn't being done so much in the past, is to continually reinforce the notion of quality improvement, reassessing, checking one's own practice and performance, and improving, with, and continually seeking education. And I think those general principles are, are good ones. But at heart, I believe most of us go into it for the right reasons. The floor is open. It seems to me, though, that we're talking about communication without talking about teamwork. And it seems to me that the most important teamwork is the relationship between physician and patient, your, your practitioner, client, clinician, and so forth. And engendering teamwork takes a lot more than simply listening. And I think getting that teamwork is what enhances care and enhances wellness and that kind of thing far more. And I'm wondering if, if anybody has looked at it from the standpoint of developing teamwork and then what you might do about that in the training of physicians as well as in the practices. Um, you know, the, the, the group practices, which are now the most only thing, as well as within hospitals. Well, you know, if you used to watch House, he always had his team. Remember that? They, you never saw nurses, but you always saw a team, you know. And uh, so I think that concept is, uh, is something that is, uh, is very important. And I think, as I said, as there's kind of a matrix of care, that communication in that team is is something I think we haven't found the, the ideal way to do that yet. You know, we, uh, 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 simple, simple uh, issues about communicating with each other uh, in a big hospital. Uh, if, if I want to, to talk to John about one of my patients, it seems simple that I would just call him on the phone and say, hey, John, would you come see this patient? Uh, but it, it's more complicated than that. So I think creating a model where people can be together, where there can be clinical care conferences, so there can be joint planning. Uh, first of all, oftentimes it resolves a lot of the complaints sometimes that are out there that the patient doesn't understand what's going on. 
And, and I think we try to teach residents this. It's just, it's taking a while to get there. I think there are two divergent streams that have had, I've observed over the last 20 years. One is that um, when I started in medicine, I mean, the nurses were intimidated to talk to the doctors or to raise you know, issues to the doctors. And there's a much more level playing field across subspecialties in the delivery of care to patients with physicians, nurses, social workers, educators, physical therapists, et cetera, having much less of a hierarchy and more of a teamwork mentality. And I think that's very good. Uh, and, and I think that's a good trend that has, I think, in my sort of anecdotal observational experience, led to um, uh, a, a, um, sort of a more multidisciplinary approach to tackling the unique issues for an individual patient. Running against that has become a um, shift work mentality of the physician workforce where, you know, now, you know, there are very strict residency limit hours and how often a patient, uh, a, a, a physician in training can be on the service. Uh, we've developed a whole specialty of just hospitalist care. The same physician following a patient from the inpatient to the outpatient setting it is very, very fractured. And um, on the physician side, that fracturing of care, I think really diminishes the capacity for somebody to really know the patient over time, to know how their changes, expectations, and goals change over time, to integrate a wealth of experience you've had in caring for a patient over time, to helping somebody through a particular exacerbation of an illness. And instead, they're getting a brand new fleet of physicians who've never seen that patient before, who have no historical context, no relationship. And so on the one hand, I think um, in the cross-sectional setting of delivering care in a hospital, there's a much great, and even in the outpatient clinic, there's a much greater interdisciplinary collaboration across specialties I think is positive. But there is a movement uh, by, I think, presumably very admirable intent to uh, fracture the uh, experience of an individual physician with a patient over time. And in our training, our trainees know, I mean, when I was a trainee, if, if somebody needed a test or a decision made, I mean, I followed that patient. I didn't, wasn't kicked out of the hospital at 9 a.m. because I'd been on call the night before, and I was offended if I couldn't be part of the conversation, making a, a treatment recommendation or talk to the patient about it because I cared for that person. I knew them. I was trying to be their ambassador through the hospitalization. Now the residents, man, they check out so fast, and they just hand off to somebody else. And I, I think that's not a positive step in the training program if we really want to nurture this communication between physicians and patients. Uh, I, I'm Myra Christopher. I work at the Bioethics Center, and I'd like to make a comment. Um, Stuart, I absolutely agree with what you said about those who choose to go into the healing professions. I often say I think all of you guys are do-gooders at heart. Uh, and John Yates, I absolutely agree with you that hospitals are working on these issues. But I think what Joe was talking about, <clears throat> and Joe, you can jump back in here, but is Paul Farmer's work <clears throat> on structural violence. And it, if that term is offensive, maybe we need to think about another way to get into this conversation. But I, I do know farmers' work, and I do know that in this community and in every community I work in, which is many, many, many across the country, there is consistent evidence of structural violence, which farmer framed that term. And let me just give you a few examples of what I see to fit that concept, and then I hope we can talk about this in a way maybe that's not defensive. Um, we continue to treat resuscitation as the default in our hospitals. Although, when we look at the population of people who are hospitalized today, their age, the severity of their illness, and so forth, for the majority of them, resuscitation efforts are not helpful. But we continue to do that because that's the way it's structured. My big deal these days is around pain. So I was part of the group that created pain as a fifth vital sign. So we ask every patient a dozen times a day, night and day, even when they're asleep. So on a scale of 1 to 10, what's your pain score? 
the data tell us that we assess pain much more often, we just don't treat it any more often. So we know pain as a fifth vital sign doesn't work. But recently, when I said to a very nice nurse that I thought the question was stupid and I wouldn't answer it in the middle of the night because she had awakened me to ask, she said, well, by law, you have to tell me. <laughs> now, I'm sound asleep, but I said, go get the law and show it to me, and then we'll talk about this. When we look at the growing literature among nurses about moral distress because they witness things happening to their patients that they know are futile or contrary to their patient's interest, I'm not sure, John, that nurses have as much power as you imagine that they do. And I think another example is when over and over and over again, we are consulted by patients and families who have been in institutions all across this country, I'm not talking about Kansas City, who don't know who their loved one's attending is, they don't know what their loved one's diagnosis is, and they don't know what their prognosis is. So um, I have great respect and great regard for healthcare professionals, and I'm grateful for the treatment that I receive when I am hospitalized, and I know people are working on this. But I think unless we are open to thinking about things a little differently, we're not likely to address the issues and many, many others that I could point out that Farmer referred to as structural violence. So I know better than to ever go up against you, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I will say a few things. First of all, um, you know, I didn't say that nurses have, you know, completely equal say or that the system is perfect and it's getting better. But I think it has changed a lot over time. I think that the hospitals are creating a much more comfortable, uh, uh, not sort of a whistleblower, but, a, but the infrastructure in place for people to voice concerns about the practicing physicians. And the administration takes that very seriously. And so there is a lot happening that I think is moving in the right direction. Um, and I wouldn't call that structural violence. You know, I, I call that as an opportunity to improve, to be humble enough to realize that, you know, we, we, we have more progress to make. I mean, look, if, if healthcare were perfect, I wouldn't have a job. So I'm glad that there are problems to work on and to, and to get better. The idea about doing CPR is a really interesting and challenging issue. And, um, uh, you know, it's, um, there, there's a recent article where they actually surveyed a large population of people from society to ask, you know, would you, when you can't get informed consent or can't solicit a patient's preferences, would you want to have, uh, th this was actually done in, would you want to get thrombolytic therapy for acute stroke, which is why I read the article, but, but they contrasted it with CPR. And in both cases, five out of six patients said, if I couldn't be told and you just found me there, I would want you to do it. A and you don't really have a choice. I mean, you know, if the patient is unresponsive and you don't have any, you know, knowledge or advanced directive, it's very difficult to not err on the hope of resuscitating, even though for a large number of patients and the patients who consult the center and who are dealt with here are ones who, you know, really, it is against their wishes. And that's not, you know, if we had a better system, we, I think that people would try and hear it. But when you don't know what the preferences are of the patient and, you know, they're just down, you know, uh, it, it's very challenging. Somebody's Well, and I, I look, the, the, no, very few entities have done more to make sure that patients' preferences, when the time is given to solicit them, get represented and get carried and get transferred across state lines and all of that. So, I mean, I think that's e e extraordinarily important work to have done and to have accomplished. And, you know, it, it uh, I mean, it is a failure. You know, we have failures in when we deliver health care. There are mistakes. And, you know, doing resuscitation is a failure in healthcare delivery if that's not aligned with the patient's goals and values. And we have to treat them as 
errors and as medical errors and to and to work on systems in place to do that and you know i, I embrace that I, I think I'm in, in line. Um, this is, however, to expand on this issue about what we can do to make um, communication better. Uh, and this is also a stealth agenda for this Center for Practical Bioethics, uh, which has done so much work in uh, developing and promoting the use of advanced directives and durable powers. So, uh, Dr. Spertus, you talked about um, the two stroke drugs. Right, and part of the better, the one with the higher risk, but the the risk of bleeding, but the one that is more likely to um, one drug to use it or not use it or not. Now, we use advanced directives for end of life, you know, refusals of treatment or requests, but why would it not be possible to think of advanced directives over a broader spectrum? So you have a population of patients whom you know to be at elevated risk for stroke, uh, and you know that when they're not actually having strokes. This is before anything happens. So why couldn't we expand our use of advanced directives for specific patients at specific heightened risk of, oh, I don't know, strokes or um, um, diabetic crises or... Um, uh, who knows what, sickle cell crises, whatever, right? To solicit their preferences and fully informed consent in advance when they're not in the throes of something and have that in their EMR, right? That's not hard to do. It would be a major agenda, but it would, might make a great deal of difference in exactly the situation you prescribed. And the Center for Practical Bioethics could take it on. I guess the, you know, we're trying, so what we're trying to do is short of that is when the stroke occurs. And, That's and the, the reason, problem. Well, right. yes and no, because if you think through the implementation challenges, right, so a stroke happens, you essentially have to present to the hospital within two hours. You have to be treated within 60 minutes. You've got to get treatment within three hours of the onset of the stroke. And just the practical implementation of finding that piece of paper, getting it sort of done at a place where... But you know, we have EMRs now. We don't need a piece of paper. But, but, you know, these patients don't even get registered in the hospital before they get treated. I mean, they come to the ER, they go to the CAT scanner, they get treated right there. They aren't even registered as hospital patients sometimes because it's that time sensitive. I, I agree. Look, I, I think that there's a whole host of things that we ought to be doing and making what we can. And when, you know, but I, I also think we need to you know, invest our energies in areas that are going to have the, the greatest yield. And, and, and it's unfair for me to focus on very technical medical issues on the underlying theme that you're representing, that it should be broader than just looking at do not resuscitation orders. And I wholeheartedly embrace that. I think that's great. The particular example that we were talking about, sometimes there are catastrophic, I mean, stroke is like really the stroke of God coming down and causing immense disability. And it happens so fast and treatments have to happen so quickly. And, um, you know, it's very challenging. And some, you know, I just don't know how we sort of circumvent that, although I'd love to be able to do it. So, so somewhat of a uh, prospective directive versus more than advanced. And one of the pitfalls of that perspective is people change their minds, as you mentioned about your husband, and how after the fact you're thankful that you saved life. End of life discussion in my day job is fairly uh, frequent, and we get advanced directives, and I'd say there's almost a 40 to 50 percent chance that they change their minds, depending on how you present the other option. So I don't think it's changing their minds because they said, oh, this is now we're end of the road. I need to change my plan now. I'll give you an example. I had a patient who was a preacher in, preacher in town and had given an advanced directive, had gastric cancer to the liver, had made it very clear that at end of life he would not want to come to the hospital, wanted to be peaceful at home. Well, his family found him confused, brought him to the hospital. This is while on hospice care. And they found that he was in renal failure. So after a few treatments, his... Uh, uremia got better. The renal doctor came in, recommended dialysis. Dialysis was done. Second day, he felt a lot better. So now the whole advanced directive 
was not practically applied because the presentation was, I think you heard Dr. Dixon say earlier, the radiologist came in and said, if I put this in, you'll be in more pain and I'll relieve your renal failure. So the dialysis, the nephrologist didn't say, I will extend your pain and discomfort. They came in and they did their job. So the fragmentation in care is lack of a primary physician to follow through the whole process. There's no continuity, continuity to follow through that advanced directive. So those prospective documents get lost in that immediate decision-making capacity. So if we choose to go down that road, we need to make sure the patient is constantly reinforced and the other decision-makers in between don't distract because of a stress in a situation. I am, Bonnie, oh, I am Bonnie Peterson, and I have had about 40 years of hospital administration experience, as well as I am a nurse, and I'm currently teaching graduate students at Washburn University. I would just like to say, and I say that because I'm speaking um, to Myra's uh, eloquency. She has articulated beautifully farmer's work, which I'm familiar with also. Um, I give you my background only because I'm also a cancer patient who has been in the hospital approximately nine times in the last two years. And I can tell you that having been in the hospital, I can tell you we have a long ways to go. I have had wonderful experiences, and I've had, fortunately, doctors who do partner with me in my care. But I can also say that there's a wide discrepancy in the way patients are cared for between one unit and another, one hospital and another. And this has been three different hospitals that I speak to. So I think that what we, the key word that you use, gentlemen, is processes. We have many processes that need to be changed within hospitals to deal with patient issues. We also really need to listen to patients more. And I've been lucky because I can speak up. My husband's been in the hospital, and I can tell you that I have gone to be his advocate uh, on pain management to a wide extent. His pain was not managed, and it took me uh, a great deal of time to work with the physicians to get that dealt with. So I think we have a long ways to go, and if you haven't been in the hospital recently, you might not know that. But we are doing better, and I will agree nurses have greater voices, uh, but I am familiar with the structural violence. People came in to do arterial sticks on me, and instead of giving up and getting somebody who could do it, they continued to do it four times. And if you've ever had an arterial stick, they're very painful. And so I was, they had done a res rapid response team, and I was saying, no, no, do not stick me again. Get somebody who knows what they're doing, and they would not listen to me and continue to stick me. So those are the kinds of things that we have got to change about our hospitals. Well, I would need a crown, number one, uh, because the authority isn't quite as great. You know, I, I think everyone has touched on the fact, both the question, people asking questions and us, you know, I think that, again, the complexity of care, the, the fragmentation that we have of the way people come in, uh, I agree with John, we, we are training doctors to be shift workers because they can't work very long at a time and, and they leave in the middle of rounds and uh, don't stay to see a procedure done because they're told if they don't do that, we're in trouble. We've created this fragmented system and how to get this matrix to fit together in a way, you know, we, we, we talked about some things, but the whole issue now when patients go home from the hospital, that's probably the most dangerous part of the hospitalizations when they go home because they go home without knowing for sure what they're supposed to do. I mean, we've told them, they've gotten all this information, they've gotten these prescriptions, but then they got nine other prescriptions at home and nobody said anything about those. And, and then, you know, we're, we're now accountable if they come back in in the next 30 days. So the, I, I do believe that the handoff from going from the hospital to home is very dangerous. A comment that you made, I think the handoff to going from one unit to another is sometimes dangerous, might be the most dangerous time in the hospital, especially going from an ICU to a, to a floor. If they go from the floor to the ICU, 
they're going because they're getting worse. If they go from the ICU to the floor, they may be going for several different reasons. I think that's dangerous. So I think, I, I don't have the answer to it, Richard. I think that's, though, one of the struggles we have of how to get that process working in a way that, that it's uh, safe, safe for the patient. We have to keep moving, but I don't have the answer. Oh, okay, thanks. Uh, I want to go back to Myra's comment, too, and not to pile on, but because I, I, first of all, let me say, I think structural violence, and Paul Farmer's the chairman of my department, so I understand what he's saying, but I think it's absolutely a great insight, but it carries with it such a connotation. It sounds like it's imputing bad behavior, because when it says violence, it sounds like... Intent to harm. Yeah. So yeah. it's... I. I, I completely agree with everything Myra said. I just wish that Paul, ha we weren't applying that. I wish we came up with a language that could honor the incredible work that people are doing to try to fix this while still not letting ourselves off the hook, which is what really Paul and Myra are both saying. And the CPR example, I'd really like to speak to that because I've, um, I've thought a lot about this. Um, Craig Blinderman, Eric Krakauer, and I wrote a paper that was published in JAMA in 2010 in which we said, we didn't use the word structural violence, but we said, but that's what we meant, Myra. Um, we said there was a moral problem when the way in which people go and ask about whether or not you want CPR, whether you want to be a, a DNR, the way in which that is practiced across the country is violent. It is doing harm. And we actually, in a kind of funny way, I hadn't thought about it till just now when we had our lunchtime conversation, John, in a sort of way, our remedy was similar to what you've been doing. You've been stratifying clinical risk and saying, let's match the treatment to the likely clinical risk of different patients, tell them their risk, and let them talk about their preferences. Well, without realizing we were doing the same thing, we were doing the same thing, but we weren't stratifying risk. We were stratifying likely benefits and harms of CPR. And in this paper, we laid out three different levels of likely benefit and harm, and we said, we should not be using the default we're using now for all three levels. And if we apply it across all three, we are doing harm. And we also called for medicine to be humbler in taking lessons from other fields. Behavioral economics has told us so much about how you structure options, channels people's choices. And there's no excuse for us not to be thinking about what we've learned from behavioral economics for how we structure, and there's that word again, how we structure choices so that they can benefit, are more likely to benefit people than to harm them. So I, I really think we have a problem. I think all of you are actually trying to solve it. I think maybe the word Paul used is very, very off-putting, but the issue is very real, and we need to be humbler and use other disciplines, systems engineers as well. You know, Harvard, uh, MGH did a lot of improvements by teaming with systems engineers from MIT and revitalized waiting, uh, reduced waiting time, for example. So looking outside of medicine and, and teaming, to use that word, with other disciplines. So thanks for giving me the time to, to make us late. Great, great panel. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McMaster.